The more I study uh, the words of Jesus and the more I, I spend time specifically looking at those, those moments in, in his ministry career where he did supernatural things, the more I find myself in awe. And it, it feels as though I should say this, even listening to myself say this, it seems silly that I'm saying this. Of course, the more we read the words of God, we spend time in his word, and we specifically study those attributes of Christ and his character, uh, how convicting and inspiring it is. You've probably spent some time thinking about this in your walk as a Christ follower. If you're, if you're new to church, maybe this will be the first time for you to consider such. But when I look at the words of Jesus, the, the more I do so, the more I'm amazed at how he pulled off all that he did. When you, you think about this man is a wanted man, people hated him, people revered him, some wanted to be around him to just feel better. Others wanted to find him, to murder him, and this mix of challenges that, that he faced, but he always stayed the course. And when you, you look at his words and the times when he was under fire, but yet he had that, that steady groove about him and the way he articulated his thoughts. I mean, even me saying this, it, it, it sounds silly of me because he's God. Of course he's going to get it right. But he's also fully human. We know this in these days that he spent time on planet Earth. And to read his words and to be challenged by these words, there's just, there's so much. And specifically today, we're in Matthew 25, if you have your Bible. We see that Jesus packed spiritual truths and lessons into short um, relatable narratives that we know to be parables. And he often taught in these, in these parables and his way of explaining God's heart and God's attributes and instructions for godly living. This was the way that Jesus communicated. And there were times when he would give a sermon and he'd knock it out of the park. And then there were times when he would use these parables that really hold a special place in his ministry and in his teaching style. And we're going to read one of these parables today as we continue this series first. We're so glad you're with us today. Good morning. My name is Jeffrey. I'm one of the pastors here for those joining us online. Good morning. I hope you guys in the midst of COVID are still finding uh, life to be fulfilling and exciting in this new year. Turn to someone next to you and say good morning. Welcome them. Nudge them a little if they're sleeping. I just get always excited. I mentioned it last week. Sunday is now my favorite day of the week. It's always been a special day for me, but to get to be here with you all, a part of the Donaldson family, it truly is a joy to open God's Word with you. I'm really excited about where we are going in Scripture today. Two weeks ago, we launched this new series, and we talked about the word seek. Everybody say seek. And we talked about this word seek being uh, this focus, this, this drive that we have to be on as we pursue what it means to place him first. Last week we looked at the semos, that Lithu Lithuanian word for family. And I, I was really challenged, as Stephen mentioned earlier, he was really challenged this week from those words. I was challenged and I continue to be challenged from last week's message. And if you ha haven't done so, just so you know, on the website at Donaldson first.com you can go and there's an archive of all of our messages and so I often do that throughout the week and just go back and I, I'm challenged it's funny I'm watching myself preach but I'm challenged with the words of God and today equally is going to be challenging for us but I really am excited about this this passage Matthew 25 the parable of the bags of gold now your translation made label this story or define the story as the parable of the talents nonetheless However, your Bible, your translation defines it. Wow, it's, it's going to be a good one. Turn to someone this morning and say, you better get ready. This is going to be big. Turn. Go ahead and tell them. You better get ready. God's Word is going to hit us right between the eyes today. Let's jump right in. Verse 14, Jesus says again, and the again is that he's been teaching here parables. He's been challenging throughout this particular part uh, of Scripture. And so he's got another one for us. And so he says again, it would be like a man going on a journey who called his servants. Everybody say servants. We're talking about serving today. I really want you to think about serving, not just in this place, in this moment, but just a life of service. He called his servants and he entrusted, this is a very interesting statement. Look what it says. He entrusted his wealth to them. 
We're going to talk about that this morning. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once, and put his money to work, and he gained five bags more. So also the man with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Well, after a long time, it says in verse 19, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. There's that word again. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. The master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Verse 24, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. And I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Verse 26, his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Look at verse 28. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. So whether your translation is mentioning bags of gold or a talent, the simple of the story is uh, we see that this master has left town. He's called his servants together. And as we read there in verse 14, he's entrusted his wealth to them. He's gone for a long time. He comes back. Two of these servants hit it out of the park. They made money on his money. They took that investment and they made it work for them. They blessed their master. The master is pleased and he gives them even more wealth. It's this one servant we see here, unfortunately, who was fearful, who was negligent. As we see, he called uh, that moment back, or Jesus rather, calls this moment with this one who had done less than best, and he simply, did you see the label he placed upon him? He called him wicked. So he's called wicked by his master, a worthless servant. And so he doesn't just take that wealth from him. He takes it and he gives it to someone else. And as we'll read eventually there in verse 30, it says he actually throws him out, out of his presence, out into a place called Darkness. Okay, guys, let's, let's unpack this this morning. Again, we're talking about what it means to be one who, who serves. I want you to go ahead and write that word down this morning. I want you to think about serving, what serving looks like for you, how you would define serving. And, and let's just so we're all on the same page, understand what are the master or, or, or I guess more fittingly, who do the master and the servants represent? Well, the master in the story represents who? Represents Jesus. You should write this down just so you're on the same page with Scripture. The master here is Jesus. And the servants, there's not one, not two, but there's three servants here. The servants are Christ followers. Those proclaiming allegiance to Jesus Christ. The challenge we see here in this passage is really important for us as it relates to our, our series uh, this month. Is that seeking God first. Will you write this this morning? Seeking God first requires me to serve well. There's just there's no way around it. If I'm going to truly place him first in my life, then that's going to call me to a place of examining how I'm living my life, who I'm living my life for, and ultimately my place of service. So let me, let me give you a couple of things to write. If you're a writer, you're probably going to write a lot today because I've got a lot I want to give you. The first is this. The first thing I see, it's in verse 14, and it really screamed to me this week as I spent time in this passage, that number one, God entrust his wealth to me. I see this clearly in this passage. God entrust 
his wealth to me. That's what we see in verse 14. It says, again, it would be like a man going on a journey. He calls his servants, and there it is, right in verse 14, entrusting his wealth to them. For every Christ follower in the room, this is a blessing. You should circle this. You may even want to underline this in uh, your Bible this morning, because what a pleasure and a privilege it is to know that God, the God of all gods, the God, amen, the God who is alive and well and on his throne, invites us into his story by entrusting his wealth to us. This is fascinating to me, and God wants us clearly to know this as a, cla- as a, as a Christ follower. I have been given God's wealth. Guys, I hope you take that home this week. I hope you celebrate this with your family. Now, what is God's wealth? Well, we could unpack that. We're really not going in that direction deeply today. But simply, it could be a variety of things. We could define God's wealth in a variety of ways for for each of us in the room. For some of you, it is financial blessing. For others, it's a talent. It's a gift. It's a privilege or a responsibility, a passion that God gives you. But as a Christ follower in the room, no one is exempt of this. No matter what you think of your life as you hold the mirror before yourself, no matter what you think others think of you, every one of you is a Christ follower in the room. Every one of you watching today online. I hope you smile when I say this. I can't see your faces, so I don't know if you're smiling. You've got that mask on there. It's the toughest part about me being here. I sure have not seen most of your faces. I can't wait to see Most of your faces, but anyway, I really, no, all of your faces, but I really hope you're smiling in this moment because the God of all gods has given you his wealth. But with this wealth comes responsibility. That's so important, I think, that we pause and consider as well. He gives us wealth, gifts, talents, passions, financial blessings. But with this wealth comes responsibility, and there is no one in the room. Listen, there is no one. Everyone say no one. There is no one in this room No Christ follower in this room exempt from this responsibility. He's given us wealth. It's a blessing. But equally, there's a tremendous responsibility as a servant. We all have a task. And so we've got a responsibility to live out this blessing that he's given us. Why? Well, the answer probably is quite lengthy to why, but I want to give you one answer real quickly, and that is this. I am going to be responsible for how I manage the wealth God has given me. And one day, one day, my master's going to return. And I'm going to answer the question, what did you do with the wealth I gave you? Every Christian in the room, an important moment for us as Christ followers. I know you know it, church, but I want to remind you of this, that one day he's going to return, and one day we're going to stand before him, and we're going to answer the question, what did I do with the wealth that was given to me. John 14, 3, just listen to this. says, I will go and prepare a place for you. Jesus speaking here. I will come back and I will take you with me. Romans 14, 12 says, so then each of us, listen to this church, each of us, look on the screen, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Whew, that's a heavy statement. That's a heavy passage to read. Each of us, not just some of us, Not just those who choose to accept this responsibility. No, every one of us, whether we accept the responsibility or not, God has entrusted his wealth to us. And we're going to answer the question, what are we going to do with that wealth? So here's a great question for you to write this morning to consider. Maybe it's a family focus moment for you this week. Uh, Maybe it's just one you want to consider right now. But the question is this, what? Will my, listen, what will my master, can we put this question on the screen? Look at this. What will my master conclude? What will Jesus have to say about how I answer the question? Right there. What have I done with the wealth entrusted to me? You ever thought about this? I mean, there's going to be a moment where we're going to stand before Jesus, the one who went to the cross and gave his life and shed his blood and conquered sin and death and rose from the grave. We're going to stand before him one day and we're going to answer the question. Have you ever thought about What you hope Jesus will conclude in that moment when you answer this question with your life? Man, I sure sure want to answer that question well. God has entrusted his wealth to me. Secondly, my bag of gold or my talent, however you want to define that or however your Bible labels this, my bag of gold may be different from yours. May be similar to yours, but most likely it's different than yours. Listen to what Romans 
Romans chapter 12. You, you don't have to go there. It's a quick verse I want to read, but this is verse 6 of Romans chapter 12. It says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. We see these, these servants here. As a matter of fact, it, it mentions that these servants, look back at Matthew chapter 25, verse, look at verse 15. It says, to one he gave five, to another two, and to another one. Look at how this sentence ends, each according to to his ability. So the master here gives these servants a bag of gold based upon their abilities, based upon the, the, the blessing, the wealth, the talent with which they have been born. We see that each servant was given something different. And I think this is okay. And I want us to really rejoice in this as we think about this today. We as a ministry team have been praying and thinking over the next couple of weeks that are going to be big weeks in the, lives of our, uh, in the life of our church as we have a, a leadership training next week that I want to invite all of you to. I'll mention that before I leave. And in a couple of weeks, uh, unless we just feel led to do otherwise, we are having Life Group launch Sunday and we're really excited about this. Many of you have been meeting and as a Life Group, we continue encourage you to do so, but we're going to open our doors here, socially distance, and step out in faith and hope that we're making the right decision there. It's a challenging decision to make, but we've been praying and, and just thinking about what this is going to look like on our, on our campus, and we're really excited to help you get plugged in, particularly those who have never plugged in before, and understand what it means to serve and to use that wealth that you've been given. And so, we celebrate that as, as a ministry team here. We celebrate our differences. And we see here, again, that according to our abilities, God calls us to a place of service. Here's a great family focus for your family this week. We, we strive to give you a family focus every week. I want you to see this one, a great conversation for you guys to have this week. Write down this question. What is unique about me? And how can I use this uniqueness to serve? It's a great conversation for for you, a great conversation starter for you as, again, you focus on your family. Why we give you this question? Because I think it's really important, particularly if you've got kiddos, grandkiddos under your influence that are watching your lead, that are looking to you to lead them and to help them understand how God has wired them and what their gifts of service are. Guys, every one of us in the room, we, we, we know this, this social media-driven world in which we live, but our kids are taking a beating online. And there's this comparison game, and even some of us at, at any age, every kid in the room, whatever your age is, if you're not careful, you can get caught in this comparison game of comparing yourself to others, seeing how someone lives online, watching a, a pic they post, a video they post, or just living life with them at work or on campus at school. It is a world driven by, by comparison, and Satan wants us to get caught up in this. We see here that all three of these servants today that Jesus blessed them, he handed them this wealth, this bag of gold based upon their ability. We see that they each had an ability. And that's the case for each of us here in this room. And hey, I hope that you'll celebrate this as a family because Satan sure wants you to get, listen to me, Satan sure wants you to get caught up in comparing yourself to others. And the danger with this, you, you, you know the danger with this. You, you know what typically happens when you begin the comparison game? Once you begin comparison, eventually you're going to be compromising. Because you're going to look at yourself and you're going to look at others and you're going to feel as though you don't measure up. Well, there it is. Write that down. I didn't spell that word right. That's supposed to be not begging, but beginning. Once I begin comparing, I will eventually begin compromising. Not begging for comparing, but beginning. I will eventually begin compromising because I will look at others. I will look at myself. I feel as though I don't measure up. The comparison game will begin, and more times than not, I will never win in this game. Church, we can't allow this to happen. We can't allow this to happen. We celebrate our differences. I tell you what I've loved about being here on campus and getting to know so many. There's still so many of you. I know I'm yet to, to really get to meet and know, and I really haven't hugged any of you. I'm waiting for that moment. Other side of COVID, I'm a hugger. I hope it's coming soon. But whether you're watching online or, or here, every one of you, I, I've seen this about our, our, our church, that we, we all bring uniquenesses. Bill and Susie, I, I, I love their, their passion for the outdoors. They've, they've helped here on campus in the past. If you've been to their house, 
house, you know, man, what a backyard they've got. If they haven't invited you, I hope that doesn't hurt your feelings. I hope they will invite you at some point. Maybe they'll do a church-wide thing at some point, and we'll just hang out in their backyard. I love the Tolberts and walking around and seeing their passion. Molly and Mr. Charles, they've done an amazing job with those grandkids, and you know this, and I'm getting to know them. And, and Rick and Miss Kay have done the same. And I tell you, Clyde Hicks, I, I mentioned him last week, but he loves serving, and he's doing a great job with our deacons, and he tells me some really corny jokes. i got a long list of people here. Troy and Julie, and I'm sorry if I didn't write everybody's name down. We don't have time for everyone. Troy has just killed it here on campus for years. Miss Julie helping with our Let's Chat ministry that I'm going to tell you more about that next week. Miss Waller does a remarkable job with her joy class. I know so because her class tells me when I talk with them on the phone and Marcia Smith and Ricky Smallwood and Miss Moss and Miss Martha and all they're doing and serving with benevolence and food pantry and room in the inn. We all have different gifts and talents and wealth that the Lord has given us as a ministry team. Guys, listen, it is our passion to help you excel well with the wealth God has given you. And we see here in Scripture that we've all been given wealth, and it might be different, and it's all good, and we want to celebrate that. Let me give you another one. Number three, I am expected to multiply the wealth. This is important. I am expected to multiply the wealth that I am given. Look at verse 18, back in Matthew chapter 25. I am expected to multiply the wealth I am given. The third servant here says, but the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and he hid his master's money. Aaron on the side of playing it safe more times than not. Aaron on the side of playing it safe more times than not gives you little to no chance to multiply your wealth. I don't see anywhere in Scripture where God calls us to play it safe. I, 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 don't, I don't see that from Scripture. What I see here is that Jesus, we could go to many a passage in Scripture, but Jesus didn't play it safe. He came to a planet knowing that he would die on that planet because he didn't play it safe. We see that he blesses these two servants because they didn't play it safe. No, man, they had the ball and they hit it. And home run after home run happened. And I see that God, listen church, God expects results from me as a Christ follower. He doesn't expect me to sit on the sidelines. He doesn't expect that I hit cruise. This is very convicting to me. It may be just go over your head today. Maybe this is not your moment. But if so, maybe you'll grab it and pull it back and maybe let it hit you here one more time. Super convicting to me. That God expects me to do much with what he has given to me. I guess you could say, you may want to write this down, that serving really is about multiplication. It's really about multiplication. If you look at serving from the viewpoint of Scripture, we see that and there, there's no pass that we get as Christians on this. That we have been called not to come and sit and get comfortable. Instead, in many ways, and we've been called to get out there, even if it's very uncomfortable, and even if it requires a, a reputation challenge or a financial challenge or you fill in the blank. I see in Scripture, specifically in this passage, that there is an expectation up on us to produce results in how we live. Two servants did, but one servant hid. And we see how the master responds. Two servants did, but one servant hid. The first two servants, 100% return on that which, with, with which they were entrusted. And guys, I tell you, this is convicting to me because now the privilege of being pastor on this campus, I tell you, I, I view, I don't know what you think about this, but I think we attend the most prettiest church in Nashville and we might run a strong challenge with just about any church on the planet. Amen? I love the beauty, the, tr the rich tradition of this place. I took Bailey to Belmont last night. She came home. We had a little birthday celebration for me, even though it was early in the week. But Bailey hadn't had a chance to come home, grilled some steaks, had a good old time, sat in the basement, built a fire. I got a few gifts. I'm really excited about those gifts. But my, my favorite part of the day was that just we were all together as a family. And I drove her back to Belmont last night. 
And I got off at Briley, and you guys know I, we just live right over here. And I'm driving down uh, Lebanon Road. And as quickly as you get off of Briley and you get on Lebanon Road, you see what? And you see that steeple. We got to get those lights fixed up there because I want that baby shining. Because when I first got here, the lights were on and now they're off. And another story. But I love, man, you pull on Lebanon Road. And Stephen mentioned it this morning. Coming from Herbenage, when you start heading this way, I mean, the steeple. I love this place. I love how beautiful this campus is. And I believe in part as one of the pastors here that God has given me a responsibility to lead well and to serve well and to specifically be about pushing us forward rather than leaving us in cruise as it relates to this blessing of wealth that we've been given. You know, it's been said before uh, that I'm kind of moving a little fast as a new pastor here. I'm challenged with that statement because I think we can't move fast enough. Because I know very soon, as Scripture tells us, our master is returning. And we're going to have a responsibility to answer what did we do with the wealth that he gave us while we were here. There is so much wealth, so much wealth. Let me say it again. There is so much wealth in this room. And I'm not even talking financially. I don't know your financial position. But I know your position as a Christ follower based upon Scripture that you have been given much. And church, I want to remind you that there is a responsibility we have to multiply. And our heart's pursuit shouldn't be to hit pause or to question, even though sometimes we should question as a team and as a church for the better of our team and our church, but not for the position of are we going to sit or are we going to move? Because I don't see in Scripture anywhere where we're called to do the hid. We're all about doing the did. That should be a country song. We shouldn't be hiding. We should be multiplying. Our pursuit, our passion should be let's go. Everybody say let's go. That's why, we're, that's why we've called our ministry of service here on campus, Let's Go. And next week we're having a Let's Go Serve luncheon. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. But guys, I want to challenge you because your ministry team is not going to stop here. We're going to be relentless at reminding you that we have been called to go. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 says this, For you know very well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And that time's going to come, and we're going to stand before him. And we're, we're going to be required to answer, to give an account. Did I did or did I hid that that the Lord entrusted to me, the wealth that he has given me? I, I, I don't know about you, but I tell you, as, as a pastor, as a husband, as a father, as a son, as a brother, man, I want to be about the did rather than about the hid. And church, I want to offer that to you this morning. What about you? When it comes to serving, who do you want to be? Who do you desire to be? As you hold that mirror before yourself and just ask yourself, can I do more? Can I be more about the did rather than the hid? We see all three of these men are called servants. It doesn't say that two of them were servants and one was just the guy who blew it. No, all three are servants. They're all three called servants. Two chose to jump in and go. And one did not. Let me ask you, we write this question down this morning. Which servant will you be? Write this down. Which servant will you be? A servant who did? Or a servant who hid? Number four, serving produces happiness. I'll give you two more, we'll finish. I really love this about this passage, and I had never paused to consider this. And the more time I spent in this passage, the more the Lord just began to reveal to me stuff that was so good. It's funny how that works. The more time I spent in this passage, that's why we are loving. I love what Stephen said this morning, the one, one, one plan. Everybody say one passage. Once a day for one week. If you haven't applied it, I hope this will be the week you apply it. And then post about it. Celebrate it with your friends. Let us know about it. You want to share a story on stage about it? We'd love to share that with the Donaldson First family. We want you to get in the Word because the more you do, the more the Word gets into you. And the more it changes you. And the more time I spend in this passage this week, the more good stuff that I found. And I, I had never seen it before. Listen, everybody wants happiness. There's no one in the room who doesn't want happiness. 
There's no one in the room who does not want happiness. I've never met the person who has said, I want to live an unhappy life. Do you know where the key of happiness is found? As this passage states, there's a variety of passages in Scripture that talk about true joy and what it means to have it. But there are very few times in Scripture where we act, actually see the word happy or happiness. But we see it here several times. You probably missed it earlier because if you're like me, maybe you just kind of rolled past it because you're not specifically focusing on this part of the passage. But, but look at what it says in verse, verse 19. After a long time, the master of the servants returned. He settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, you've entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. Look at verse 21. His master, Jesus, replies, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Here it is. Come and share your master's happiness. The man, look at verse 22, with two bags of gold. Master, you've entrusted me with two. I've gained two more. Verse 23, his master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Here it comes again. Come and share your master's happiness. Did you know that was there? We are seeing, guys, that there is this connection between serving well and finding happiness. This just jazzes me this morning because I know I want happiness in my life. I know you want happiness in, in your life. And we see here that God does too. God wants us to be happy. We see it right there. Serving well brings about happiness in our lives. As you serve well and you multiply, look at the reward. Look at verse 29. For whoever, for whoever has will be given more. And he will sit. I'm sorry. For whoever has will be given more. And they will have an abundance. Look at what it says. Whoever does not have, even what they have, will be taken away from them. And then look at verse 30. Whew. Throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and there will be gnashing of teeth. Guys, do you see the connection here? We serve well and it produces happiness in our lives. But we don't serve well and it produces darkness. And rage and emptiness. And actually, Scripture says a weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, so where does this take us this morning? Well, let me give you this, number five. It leads us here. Three words. Let's go serve. Let's go serve. When I, when I think about serving, I, I'll tell you guys, I, I've been guilty in the past of thinking, mostly about serving as it relates to a position at church and, and volunteering and, and loving those well in our congregation and all these service opportunities that we have here on campus. And there are many, and we're going to continue to share those with you. We get on the other side of COVID, and we, we just know we're going to be the, the better church for it. But as I started thinking about serving this week, I just began to literally laugh at myself because I had not been thinking about other areas in, in, my, in my life. But th there are so many ways that we can serve. I'll, I'll give you a couple. You may want to write this down. You, you know this to be true, but I, I want to remind you of this, that serving can also be about just how we treat the planet. That there are many opportunities to just serve this planet well. I mean, we could go through the list of recycling and not littering. I tell you, Kara, who has just been a, such a blessing to us here on our team, she reminds me all the time to turn the lights off and to don't print unless I actually need to print. And let's go digital, and we're working on that. But we could have a whole conversation about that, about just serving the planet well. Also, I can serve my home well and serve in my home well. I, we, we talked about family a, a little bit last week. You know, 52% of marriages we now know end in divorce. What a staggering stat. 52% of marriages. And for the first time in America, fewer than half U.S. kids in America live in a home where there are two married hetero, hetero, heterosexual parents who were still in their first marriage. Isn't that staggering? Half, actually less than half, of kids living at home in America right now live at home where mom and dad heterosexual parents are still in their first marriage. Now, we, we talked a lot about family last week, so 
We're not going to walk down that road today, even though I'm really excited about a series that's coming this spring called Family Strong, and I'm super, super, super excited about this. But when I think about statistics such as these that just show the separation of families and the battle that moms and dads are, are facing, I, I mean, can I dare say this, that possibly, possibly marriages fall apart and husbands and wives turn and embrace something other than what the Lord would have them to, in part because of this, write down this sentence if you're writing. This has to be one of the keys. One of the keys to a successful marriage, I believe, begins with realizing I love well when I serve well. That I, I, I love my spouse well when, when I serve my spouse well. And it got me thinking this week about so many ways that I can just be, be better at serving, I, I think about my memo, and I, I talk about my, my family from Arkansas a lot. My memo passed away a couple years ago, day after Christmas. We, we, we miss her. We think about her all the time. Her picture's hanging in my office, and my, my pepa as well. And, you know, I, I remember, I don't know how many years it, it was after, after Papa died, but, but memo came to Nashville, and she stayed a few days with, with Amy and me, and I don't even think the girls were, were born yet. And, and we went out to lunch. I just loved my times with, with my memo. And I, re, I remember in conversation one time, she said, you know, Jeffrey, she said, Papa um, wasn't the easiest of men to live with. <laughs> and I, I didn't really ask her a lot about that, and she didn't share a whole lot more. But I've, I've thought often about that, and I thought, you know, when he was living, I sure never saw that from her. I, I never saw from her and how she responded to him and loved on him that he was a difficult man to live with. But obviously, like all of us, we have those moments where we just do less than best. And so I, I, I get that, uh, but I, I never saw that from her and how she just served him so well. And then I, I thought about my, my parents this week. And I don't know, but my mama probably wouldn't call my daddy a romantic. <laughs> she probably wouldn't call Jerry Smith a, a, a romantic, but... And I alluded a little bit to this last week, but you know, I can never remember a time when my mama and my daddy fought, ever. I can never remember a time. And I thought about it all week when, when Kent and Jeremy and I were living at home and I saw and heard my daddy raise his voice at my mama. Now, it probably happened, but I, I never saw it. And how my memo served my papa and how my daddy served and is still serving my mama, not, not perfectly, but it convicts me to ask, how can I serve better? How can I serve Amy and Brennan and Bailey better? How can I serve my brothers better, my parents better? Man, there's places that we could park here, but I want to remind you that service in many ways can happen in the home, and we just must strive to keep getting better at that. Let me give you another one, serving at work. This summer, we're going to do a series on just the workplace, and I just wanted to mention it this morning. But I get this. I know it's tricky. Working with others we don't like, and even working with people we do like can be challenging. Amen? I mean, work is just challenging, and emotions get involved, and disagreements happen. And we all know, particularly here in the American culture, that work is about uh, getting to where you want to get and who you want to be. And it often begins in elementary school and we're programming in our kiddos to make the grade and land the degree and get the job and make the bank and drive the right car and live on the right side of town. And there's a good conversation we can have in that. Not that it's wrong, but if it's driving us and it's not the, uh, in a place of priority, it can get messy. But what if, guys, what if, think about this, what if our pursuit as workers we're less about worldly acclaim and less about getting to the next raise and the next position. And it truly were more about a pursuit of loving others that we work with. And just as we strategically think about how to make a project succeed or how to land that next promotion, that we equally are thinking, Man, how can I love on that person I just don't like at work? And imagine how we as Christ followers, using the wealth we've been given, in an environment sometimes that could be fragile, our work environments, if we said, I want to work well, I would have you write this question down this morning. How can I better serve those I work with? And then let me give you this last one. When we're talking about let's go, let's serve, obviously there are so many opportunities here at Donaldson First. How can we serve well 
at Donaldson First. Well, I've mentioned it already twice this week. I want to personally invite you, if you are serving in any capacity here on campus, or you would be more more interested at some point in the future in serving here in some way at Donaldson First, we just want to love on you next week at our, our leader's lunch. We're going to have a let's go serve volunteer lunch, and we're going to talk. We're going to talk about some ways that you can serve coming this, this spring. We're going to talk about some new ministries we have. You see it there on the screen. I just want to personally invite you that if you have never served before, but you've thought about it, hey, guys, this is a great time to jump in. If you've been serving, you're thinking, well, that's not for me. I already serve. Hey, this is a great time for you to join us for lunch. We're going we're gonna to feed you, and so we need you to RSVP, and we're going to be in the Family Life Center. We're going to socially distance well over there and spread out, and it's going to be right after the service next week. You should have received an email this week. If you did not, call the office. That means most likely we don't have your correct email address. Or you can just call and reserve, or you can go to donaldsonfirst.com, and under the uh, Connect tab, you can see a tab to hit that lets you, right under Connect, there it is, three down. You see Connect homepage, I'm new, there's the question. Want to serve? Let's go ministry. Hit that tab and you can fill out a form and you can register you and your family. We want to serve well on this campus. And so whether you've been serving or you're thinking about serving, hey, come and join us. We're going to end in a time of prayer because we know there's a responsibility we all have to serve well. And so we just want to prepare well. The best thing we can do as servers as responsible people of what the Lord has blessed us with is to spend some time in prayer. So, hey, I sure want to invite you to come. Uh, again, we need you to RSVP. Here is our motto of the year. I want you to write this down. All in by year's end. Will you write that down? All in by year's end. We want everyone to find their place of service in 2021 on our campus in some way. And there are so many of you already doing this. We want to help you do it better if we can. If not, then we just want to applaud you and say stay the course. But those who have yet found that place, all in by year's end. We want to continue pushing you this year because we see that no one gets a pass on this. Did you see verse 30? Look at this and we're going to pray. Did you see verse 30? It says, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and there will be gnashing of teeth. Do you see what the real focus of this passage is? It's a focus on eternity. That's what Jesus is alluding to here. That there's going to be a moment when those who chose not to surrender life to him while walking planet earth will be separated for an eternity from him. In a place the Bible labels as, listen again, darkness, outside that doesn't just mean the opposite of inside. No, it's a, it's a Greek word that means separated from eternity with Christ. That there's this place, the Bible calls it hell. So Jesus' real focus here is that his desire, first and foremost, is that we find our place eternally with him. And that it's truly about placing him first. This is the last thing I would have you write this morning. When I serve well, I place God first. And that truly is what a personal relationship with him is all about. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? And I would ask you to consider when it comes to the most important decision you could make in your life, surrendering your life to him. Have you ever done that? Because serving well begins with getting this right. Of coming to a place and saying, Jesus, I, I just want to give my life to you. I had a great conversation.